Uh, please remain standing, and if you have your Bible, would you turn to Isaiah 53? Isaiah 53. We'll begin with this wonderful passage from the Old Testament that describes the literal uh, sacrifice and all that our Savior went through on the cross of Calvary. Isaiah number 53. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed." All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy and his infallible word this morning. Let us all unite our hearts together in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you praise and thanksgiving for Jesus our Savior. Uh, we are going to rehearse the sayings from the cross today. Uh, we're going to sing the songs of the cross. We're going to have ministry and music from the, of the cross. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that you might bless all of these parts of our service today uh, to our spiritual health and growth and satisfaction. Uh, it, it is truly uh, unbelievable what you went through in order to secure our salvation by going to the cross of Calvary, shedding your blood all over Jerusalem, and then finally there at the cross, and then the powerful resurrection to follow. So today, may we, may we truly treasure uh, the fact that our sins were paid for by our precious Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, that he was the only one that could do that, and it was a once and for all payment that was made. And so we're so, so thankful for that today. Uh, bless each one who has come uh, to the service and those watching uh, by technology uh, we ask that you would just give us a, a powerful blessing as we consider our wonderful Savior and all that he went through to secure for us eternal life. So we give you praise, we give you thanksgiving, we magnify the name of Jesus, and we ask all of this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. This time we'll do our first and second sayings of our wonderful Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, from the cross of Calvary. In Luke chapter 23 and verse 34, we have the first thing that our Savior says from the cross. 
In Luke 23, 34, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The Lord Jesus Christ is barely making it down the road of sorrows when a passerby, Simon, is called upon to pick up that 100-pound patibulum, that crossbar that those who were crucified had to carry to the place of execution. So they're about 200 yards into the procession of the 650-yard walk. And you think about that, six-and-a-half football field walk uh, from uh, uh, Pilate's Hall to the place of execution at Calvary, the place of the skull. Jesus is already horribly, terribly tortured. And he stops briefly and he speaks to the ladies of Jerusalem, urging for them to repent. Simon, of course, he's taking all this in as he is carrying the patibulum for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They reach the place of the skull, and Simon drops that patibulum onto the ground. The soldiers forcibly take the Lord Jesus Christ, and they lay him down on that crossbar, and they nail his wrists to it with very large nails. Then four soldiers would pick up that patibulum with the Lord Jesus nailed to it, and dangling on it, they would pick it up and they would place it in the notch on the standing pole called the stipes. Then they would take his legs and they would bend them at the proper angle and then nail them to the cross. And so his legs are bent so he is, has the ability to push himself up and then lower back down in order to breathe. Everything about the crucifixion was designed to cause more and more suffering. And then Jesus prays, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The verb tense is a continuous action. So the Lord Jesus prayed for these people time and again as he hung there on the cross. Jesus practiced what he preached. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Matthew 5, 44. So Jesus did exactly what he preached. Our second saying from the cross comes from Luke 23, 43. Luke 23, 43. Now it's going to get interesting because now we're bringing in the thieves. And we're going to look at three things about them. We'll look first of all at the robbers and then their response and the results. So in Luke 23, 43, the Lord Jesus says, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. The uh, best news you could ever hear if you are a dying thief on the cross there at Calvary. Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. So first of all, we look at these robbers. So the crucifixion includes not just our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but two hardened criminals, and they're there because they are guilty. They're guilty. The Lord Jesus was not guilty, but they are. Uh, they were not innocent at all. And so, as the curtain opens on this scene, both of them are spewing mockery and blasphemy against the Lord Jesus Christ, along with the majority of the crowd as well. So, as they pulled themselves up for another breath of air, they hurled insults, railings, blasphemy, and taunts. One of them continues to go ballistic while the other one falls silent. So then we see, secondly, the response. One of these robbers never changes course in what he is doing, but the other one had an awakening. He had an awakening. His whole outlook changes. 
No longer is he hurling insults, but now he is rebuking the other robber on the other cross. His response was acknowledgement and confession. He did exactly what every sinner has got to do to be saved. Everyone has to do that. He acknowledged his sin and he confessed it. And then he declares that Jesus, this man here, he has done nothing wrong at all. You know, in the midst of this man's robberies and crime sprees that he had been a part of before he was caught, he had to hear the stories of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says to the other, the other robber, don't you fear God? Like, what's the matter with you? Don't you fear God? And then this robber responds in saving faith. And he says to the Lord Jesus Christ, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then we have the result. The result of what happens with the robbers there on the cross. The short answer is this. One of them went straight to hell. And the other one went with the Lord Jesus Christ to paradise. And then he went straight with the Lord to heaven as well. So we're going to focus just on the one for a moment who repented. Jesus said, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. That condemned robber now has something to focus on besides death. I'm going to paradise with this God man and it's going to happen today. When I die, I'm going to be with him in paradise. He had a future that was going to be totally awesome. Amen. We'll move on to the third saying from the cross of Calvary. We find this in John chapter 19 verses 25 to 27. John chapter 19 verses 25 through 27. <clears throat> Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by, whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. That's significant there that John took her away from the cross that hour. And that was uh, the, the sunly thing to do. And uh, that was a, a brilliant uh, move on his part uh, as he did that after Jesus uh, turned the care of his mother over to the apostle John. So here in John chapter 19, 25 to 27, we see the Lord Jesus' final instructions to his own. His final instructions to his own. We can't even imagine what, what the pain was like for Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the other ladies who were at the cross. We have several, at least four ladies are there. We only have one disciple there. Where are the rest of them? Well, they're, they're back at the house, and they got the door shut, and, and they've got the bars up, and they got the nails and the hammer out, and they nailed it shut because they're thinking, we're next. And so they, they're scared to death, but no, not John. John's a special guy, the youngest uh, of the disciples, very special man. And uh, he is there. And uh, he, he was at, through the whole process. Uh, he did not take off. He did not go anywhere. So here they are. So here on the cross uh, uh, is Mary's son. And the one that she has raised, the one that she has nursed, the one that she has nurtured in life, and then the one that she has watched, and the one that she has listened to, and the one that she will become a disciple of in the future. So here we are at the cross. This is a very, very powerful thing. Uh, she has uh, been there with the Lord Jesus at the first miracle. 
Remember that? She says to the servants, whatever he tells you to do, you just do it. See, she knows. <laughs> you never know what her son Jesus is going to do. <coughs> Turning that water into wine at the, that marriage there at Cana of Galilee. And here we are, and Mary is really, really hurting. A and we're astounded uh, by the fact that after all that Jesus has been through up to this point, he is still taking care of his family. He is still doing it. You know, God is always in control, and Jesus on the cross of Calvary is in total control from start to finish. There's never one second that he is not in control of the whole situation because you know what he could do. He could say, I'm done with this. He could have slaughtered all the thugs, all the soldiers. He could have come down off of that cross. He could have done anything. He is God. He did not do that. He had a job that he has been called to do by his Father in heaven, and he is going to do it. And he's under total control of the situation. And what we see here is the fact that he gives very tender instructions, very tender instructions from the cross. And his words reveal the depth of love and care that he has for his own. His pain is unbelievable, yet he cares intimately and he cares completely for his own family. It is truly an amazing thing. John is standing there. He's right there beside Mary, the only disciple at the cross. And Mary and John. Hmm. Mary and John. They were the two that loved Jesus most on this earth. And they had the most to lose when Jesus dies on the cross, so they think. The Lord Jesus gathers his strength, and he gives his instructions. He says, Dear Mother, this is now your son. John, this is now your mother. John knows what to do. Jesus is bearing our sins on the cross, and he's still able to take care of his family. You know, oftentimes in our lives we wonder, is, is Jesus really looking out for us? Does he really care about what's going on in my life? You just remember this story right here. You remember the cross. Jesus on the cross... Most of his blood is already gone. He's in excruciating pain, and he cares for his mother. Don't ever forget that whenever you have a hard time and you start to wonder. Remember how he took care of his mother from the cross. Our fourth saying from the cross comes in Mark 15 and verse 34. In Mark chapter 15 and verse 34... We find the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and these are uh, incredible words to say where Jesus says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus' death was dramatically emphasized by the darkness that came upon the earth when it should have been the brightest part of the day. Here we are sitting in church and remembering our Savior and what he went through on the cross, and this is the brightest, most beautiful part of the day. We, we can look out our window there and see the brightness. I can look out the window in the back and see the sun shining. But on this day... It was absolutely black. I'm sure the soldiers had some torches around. <laughs> you got to have torches right now because we can't see, abs we can see nothing, nothing at all. Three hours of darkness. And this darkness was sudden. And this darkness is scary. I mean, for all of us here right now, if, if the outside went black right now, 
a lot of us would be moving and wondering, and uh, some of us might even get up and get out of here. I'm going home. <laughs> it, is, it is just dark outside like never before. It is dark, and it is quiet. And this darkness signifies the curse of God on his son at this point in the crucifixion. Sin was poured out upon Christ's soul until he became sin for us. God took the sinless Lord Jesus Christ and poured into him our sin. And then he poured into us his righteousness. Wow. He took our sin that we might obtain his righteousness. So wave after wave after wave of the world's sin is poured over our precious Savior's sinless soul. And for three hours, he is convulsing and he is recoiling there on the cross as all the wickedness and filth of the world is poured on his purity. In the dark of the cross's night, Jesus was alone. This never happened before. Jesus was never, ever before without the fellowship of God his Father. Now it happens. Jesus experienced the horror of being completely cut off from God there in the darkness and the silence. And the words from Jesus' heart, My God, my God, why? Hast thou forsaken me? This undoubtedly shook those who were there at the cross. This, this is something they have never ever witnessed before in all of their days. Jesus' cry expressed his incredible pain at his real abandonment by his Father in heaven. My God, my God! That was an affirmation of Jesus' trust in his Father. Yes, I've been abandoned, but I trust him. And you know what? We better trust him too. When you feel abandoned, when you're down, you can still trust in God, your Father in heaven. Jesus, in his abandonment, had emptied his cup to the very last drop. Jesus had tasted the ultimate horror of a lost soul, abandoned by God, and experienced the torment of a soul in hell. Wow. Now there's something people need to think about that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Jesus experienced what they're going to experience if they do not trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Wow. It is dark. He cries out to God in heaven. It is dark. And it is soul penetrating. And it is absolutely silent. The fifth saying from the cross of Calvary is found in John 19. I'll read verses 28 and 29, John chapter 19, verses 28 and 29. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. Jesus said, I thirst. I thirst. Well, I'll tell you what, the hours, the hours of torture that, that the Lord Jesus has endured in the past 24 hours has been unbelievable. It has taken a tremendous toll on his body. Uh, if you just start rehearsing everything that that, that happened to him from starting with the trials and then the, the flogging and, and so forth. It's just unbelievable. Jesus now is experiencing a fever of thirst. 
He is dehydrated. That has already set in. And Psalm number 22 gives us very, an, a very accurate description of our Savior on the cross. In Psalm number 22, in verses 14 and 15, the Bible says, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. That is a, a broken piece of pottery. My strength is dried up like that. And, and my, uh, my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. Well, you know what? Jesus is thirsty here, but Jesus isn't done yet. He has more to say. And so he is going to need uh, some help with that, uh, with some liquid. He is divine. He's also uniquely man. And he feels the same kinds of pain that we do. Uh, only uh, we have no clue how bad this was for uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But he knows exactly how we feel uh, when we go through the physical trials of life. Uh, Jesus has er had earlier in the process refused to take the, the alcoholic beverage that they would give to criminals. Why did they do that? It, it would take a little bit of the sting out of the pain and agony that they were going through. But Jesus said, no, I'm, I'm not going to have that. His mission is now almost complete. And his cry of thirst will be met from a sponge dipped in vinegar. The Lord Jesus had a need right now for his lips to be moistened because he has two more powerful things to say. Two more sayings to go. And so this is going to help him to get them out and have some moisture there in his mouth. And so uh, there's scripture that still is going to be fulfilled. I mean, Jesus has been fulfilling scripture through this whole process. One, two, three, four, five, uh, and on and on it goes. Uh, he completely fulfills scripture he completely fulfills everything written about him and he knew that there was a little left to do and he did it that brings us to our sixth saying from the cross now whenever uh, we we get together and all our churches get together for this this sixth one this is the one all the preachers they are hoping that that one falls on them <laughs> this is the one. Why? It's in the Greek. It's one word, tetelestai. Tetelestai. It means in English we translate it. It is finished. It is finished. John 19 and verse 30. Jesus says, tetelestai, finished. Now this is the thing that we that we know, but a lot of people don't know, and they need to get this. It is finished and it always will be finished there is nothing more that has to be done jesus totally did everything that had to be done what has christ finished well he finished the law itself now talk about a big undertaking <laughs> that was it he finished the law he completed it and he fulfilled it he also fulfilled all of the Old Testament types in the ceremonial law. He fulfilled the messianic prophecies. But most of all, he now finishes the atonement. He finishes the atonement. And for, in order for you to have atonement, there has to be a blood sacrifice. And Jesus, in his perfect body and perfect blood, uh, uh, provides the blood sacrifice that is required. We sing to him, lifted up was he to die. It is finished, was his cry. Now in heaven, exalted high. Hallelujah, what a Savior. You know, Jesus controls this whole process on the cross of Calvary. Everything happens there. It's going to happen just the way he wants it to. And by the time Jesus utters this word, tetelestai, 
His body is starting to feel the chilling effects of death coming on. But he is still in control. He's in control today. Uh, this word was not released in weakness, but this word was released in strength. This word was uh, released in triumph. And the Lord Jesus just took that beverage and he shouts it. It is finished. He shouts it to Telestai. It is a shout of victory. And, he, and, and it's not the fact that he's dying a horrible death, but because God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. Jesus finished the work that saves. Jesus finished the work that saves. No one can add anything to the work that Jesus did. That's why we call it a finished work. Jesus said, Tetelestai, finished, done. There is nothing more to do to secure the salvation of everyone who will do one thing, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is all you have to do. Read John chapter 6. You know, if you are doing, you are not done. How much do you have to do until you're done? <laughs> There's a lot of people out there that think they got to keep on doing whatever it is that they're doing. They got to keep on doing it. My question to them is, when are you going to be done? How much work do you have to do until you're done? Hmm. Well, I'm here to tell you, folks, we don't have to worry about that because Jesus finished it. He did it all. We don't have to do anything. Jesus did what had to be done. So it's done. So in our world today, people all over the world, you are either doing or you are done. Now, I'm in the done crowd. The doing crowd, they're not going to make it. <laughs> they're not going to make it. Because they did not believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus gave his life for us. Nobody took it. No one took his life. When Jesus bowed his head in death, it was his timing. It was not the timing of the soldiers. It was not the timing of the religious thugs. It was not the timing of anyone. When we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, it is just like the repentant thief. The hymn writer said, Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Come to our final saying from the cross, from our, the lips of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And these words are found in Luke chapter 23 and verse number 46. The final thing uh, from the cross. He has just said it's done, it's over, it is finished. To tell us die. And then he says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. I want to point out right away that there were miracles all over the place at the cross of Calvary. In verse 46, the Bible says that Jesus cried with a loud, mega voice. It was a big voice. It was a triumphant voice as he finishes his sixth and seventh saying from the cross. In our lives, we would think of ourselves today if we had gone through what Jesus went through on the cross of Calvary, if our faces had been beaten so badly by soldiers and others that you couldn't recognize us, that ripped out uh, uh, the beard from your face, I really wonder if we would be saying anything at all. <laughs> this, is a, this is a miraculous event here at the cross of Calvary, one of many where Jesus says very loudly, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And we're reminded once again that it is dark. It is dark from 12 noon to 3 in the afternoon. And this is a supernatural darkness. 
There are many miracles at the cross and before the cross of Calvary. The next miracle thing that happens is the veil in the temple is cut straight down the middle. The veil, 60 feet high, as thick as a man's hand. You're not cutting that with a pocket knife. Now, I don't know who cut it, but I, but I like my name, Michael. Michael the Archangel. You know, maybe, maybe he came down with his flaming sword. And, you know, it wouldn't have taken long for him to cut through that thing. It is a supernatural miracle. God just said, boom, you know, this thing is done. We're not going to have any more sacrifices, folks. This was the last one right here on the cross of Calvary. You know, these soldiers had been at a lot of crucifixions. And this one, <laughs> as they find out almost every moment, this is no ordinary crucifixion. We have the words of the centurion glorifying God. Truly, this man is the Son of God. I think we're going to see that guy in heaven. I think we're going to see that centurion uh, when we are gathered with our Lord and Savior. And so, Abba, Father, Father, my Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit this was powerful this was revolutionary father framed the the life of jesus from the word go uh, the, the father empowered his ministry uh, going back to when jesus was a 12 year old boy what did he say i must be about my father's business the disciples say Lord, teach us to pray. And he said, say, our Father. Jesus used Father from start to finish. We don't want to miss the power of those words. It, it was not whispered. It was shouted from the cross. It, it, they were not words of defeat. They were words of triumph. This is no ordinary crucifixion. Most men who were crucified went unconscious and faded away into eternity. Jesus is in total control of this whole thing all the way to the end. Jesus decided when he was done with this physical body and it would die. No one else was. He was total control. It was a triumphant saying from the cross. Jesus had taken no drugs from the soldiers. They all took the drugs from the soldiers. They all wanted to lessen the pain. Not Jesus. He did not do that. Jesus wanted to remain and be in total control. He was not going to have any alcohol in his body at all. That's not going to control me. I'm in control of this situation. He was in total control of his heart and his mind until the very moment he closed his eyes in death. He took the sin of the world upon himself. He suffered fully and he died with a triumphant shout, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Amen. Let us pray together. Father, thank you so much for bringing us together today on Good Friday to rehearse the events of the cross of Calvary, the wonderful things that our Savior said. We thank you that he is God. He left heaven to come down here that he would get on that cross and shed his blood and die for us that we could have everlasting life. We sit here today, we stand here today as beneficiaries of thy grace because we have trusted in the blood of Jesus. We have trusted in his resurrection that we will be looking at in just a couple days. So, Father, we love you. We love the cross. We love our Savior. We love what he had to say. We love his triumph. We're so thankful that he loves us unconditionally and that he made a plan 
that we could be saved from the penalty of our wretched, awful sin. So we love you, Lord Jesus. We give you praise. We give you thanksgiving. Bless our reflections on the cross of Calvary throughout this day. All glory goes to you, our great God in heaven. And we ask all this and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.